Stretch your legs. Have a seat. Have a seat. Boy, y'all sound good, man. Thanks. Everyone but Fernando sounds good. <laughs> no, boy, it's a joyful noise. That's what it is, right? Say amen when you can, Fernando. <laughs> oh, brother. Listen, uh, we are so glad to be together with you guys this morning. And, you know, that sounds so cliche. It sounds so rote. But, guys, when we say that here at Crossway, when we come in and we see new faces, we really want you to know, if you're visiting with us, you're our honored guest. And we really are glad that you're here. And we're thrilled, in fact, um, that you're here uh, with giving us the opportunity and giving God the opportunity to, to move into your heart in a deeper way. And that's what we want. We want you to leave here with a blessing that you can take away from here and share with someone else. The blessing doesn't have to end with you. Hopefully you leave with that this morning and you can go share with someone else. In your worship bulletin, when you first came in, uh, hopefully, go ahead and let me hear you pull out those notes. Let me hear those papers rustling. Let's go. Let's take those notes out and get your pens ready. And we're going to have a great time this morning. We're going to have a two-part series to begin our new year before we launch into our theme which, by the way, we're having our big end-of-the-year banquet at the beginning of the year, like we always do, to sort of, this evening, to sort of reflect and just celebrate the year that God gave us in 2022 and to look forward to all the good things that He wants to do for us in this coming year. And so we invite you to come and be a part of that this evening. It will be from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Dinner is served so come and join us. It won't be here. It will be at the Boys and Girls Club over there off of um, Business Loop. Um, I think it's 9th Street. That's what I said. 7th Street. No. Um, but hopefully y'all know where it is, right across from Hickman High School. So seriously, come. Uh, Pancheros or Pancheros, however you want to say it, is catering tonight. It's going to be great. So uh, come and join us for that. And I, th I don't think you will be sorry that you did. But anyway, um, we got a two-part series before we launch into our new theme, which will be announced tonight at the banquet. It's a big secret, so come and you can find out tonight uh, what our whole theme for the year 2023 will be. So this is not it, but for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about a refresh start. Now, I'm sure some of you guys have heard of a fresh start, right? Y'all have heard that terminology before, a fresh start. Everybody wants a fresh start. I looked this up on Google, and the, I mean... Instantly, there are several businesses that call themselves this. There was an IRS um, plan, apparently, that you can be a part of where it relieves taxes, and it's called the Fresh Start Tax Relief. Um, there's recovery ministries and recovery alcohol and drug recovery houses that are called Fresh Start Ministries or Fresh Start Houses. And so you know this idea, this, this concept of, I want a fresh start. It's not unfamiliar to us when it comes to New Year's. What, what does everybody do during the New Year's? They have New Year's resolutions, right? They want to get off this New Year to a good, fresh start. And I want to tell you this morning, we're going to talk about not a fresh start, but a refresh start. And hopefully that will be a little bit uh, enlightening to you. But look at the first passage that comes up on your notes there in Zechariah, the prophet, chapter 10, verse 6. We learn something about the God that we're talking about this morning, the God that I served, the God that I surrendered to back in 1998. He says, I'll save the people of Joseph. I know their pain, and I will make them good as new. Turn to somebody and say, God can make you good as new. Tell somebody. I don't know if y'all believe it, but by the end of this morning, you're going to believe it, okay? Listen. <laughs> God says, they'll get a what? Say it with me. A fresh start. As if nothing had ever happened. And why? Because I am their very own God. I'll do what needs to be done for them. Now, in a lot of translations, you'll notice that I, I used, and I carefully chose this for this reason, if you had the NIV or the New King James or the King James or one of those um, more traditional translations, and you didn't have the paraphrase that's known as the message here, you wouldn't have this phrase, fresh start. You would have something like a new beginning. 
But I chose the message paraphrase because every time it's talking about something becoming new, it uses this idea of a fresh start. Similarly, in the message paraphrase, when we look at Psalm chapter 145 in verse 14, it says, God gives a hand to who? To those that are down on their luck. Anybody feel that way this morning? Feel like maybe 2022 was a little rough for you? Things didn't really stack up the way that you intended. Maybe things didn't go the way that you wanted. You didn't get all of your New Year's resolutions that you began January of 2022. You didn't get any of them done. Or maybe a few of them. But maybe you're down on your luck. Maybe you lost jobs. Maybe you lost relationships over 2022. Maybe things haven't been the best. But he says, God gives a hand to who? Those that are down on their luck. He gives a fresh start. To those ready to quit. Now I don't know guys if any of y'all have felt that way this year. Like you're ready to quit. And you could be ready to quit a lot of things. It could just be I'm ready to quit my job man. I am sick and tired of my boss. (laughs) And I'm ready to quit. Or maybe let's get a little more serious if that wasn't already serious. But maybe in your marriage. You looked at that person that once upon a time you looked with goo-goo eyes and thought they're awesome. And you look across now and you go, I'm ready to quit. Or maybe it got so bad. And guys, we, we have folks that came on this church plant. There was 24 of us that started this um, when we first moved out here to Columbia to start this church. But we have folks, multiple people that came out here as church planters. That once upon a time said they were ready to quit life. And I don't know if that's you. If you've ever gotten that low where you're just like, you know what? No one's going to miss me. I'll just end it. I'll just go quietly into the night and, and I'll just be done. But I want you to know this morning that we serve a God of fresh starts. A God of second chances and third chances and fourth and fifth and however many you need chances That's the God that I read about in the scriptures. This is not just pie in the sky. Oh, the preacher's going to tell you nice things that you want to hear. That's not what I'm doing. It just happens to be biblically true about the God that we serve. He is a God of as many chances as you need. And so this morning, I wonder how many of you guys need a fresh start? How many of you guys would like to just have a clean slate? Let's put 2022 behind us and let's move forward and let's do better. Anybody there with me? Anybody ready for a fresh start? All right, good. So let's talk about this. Now, maybe you have the best 2022 of your life and you're like, I don't want a fresh start. I want momentum. (laughs) And maybe that's the case. But I think either way, wherever you find yourself, I think you're going to find God's word this morning to be incredibly challenging and incredibly encouraging. I know it has been to me in my preparation uh, to present this to you guys. Look at the next verse in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. This is where I got the title of the sermon, a refresh start, rather than just a fresh start. It says, so now you need to rethink everything and turn to God so your sins will be forgiven and a new day can dawn. Days of refreshing times flowing from the Lord. I want you to take your pen and circle the word refreshing. You see, God has promises for a new day. He promises to refresh you. That word in the Greek language, which the Bible was originally written in, that word carries with it the idea of your cooling down and catching your breath again. That time of refreshing. Y'all know what I'm talking about. When you've just been running left and right and you're out of breath and you're, you're sweating and then somebody just comes in and lets you sit down, takes the burden away from you, lets you calm down, lets you cool down and gives you a nice cold glass of water or maybe some Propel or some Gatorade, whatever is your preference or a nice good glass of ice cold lemonade. I don't know what does, what floats your boat, okay? But you know what I'm talking about and that's what God says. He says, listen, I don't care how hard it's been. I'm telling you that I can provide a time of refreshing. But what I want you to notice is that this verse helps us out tremendously because it's not saying that God will just zap everyone with a refreshing time. But you have a responsibility in it, don't you? 
What does it say? He says, you need, here's what you need to do. If you want refreshing, you want a refresh start. And I think this is significant to say refresh start because this is biblical. We're talking about a time where God comes in and refreshes you. That kind of new start. Because see, some people, when they say fresh start, this is what they mean. What they mean is, okay, I'm going to change churches. Well, here's why I'm going to change a church. Because I got really close to the people at this church, and now they know my past. And I keep repeating my past, and I just feel like it's, you know, just always with me. So I need to go somewhere where people don't really know me, and I can have a fresh start. Guys, that's not a fresh start. It's certainly not a refresh start. That's taking the same you and just transplanting your problems into a new place where it will just repeat itself again. You can't run away from your problems. You have to face them head on. And that's what this says. He says you need to rethink everything. You want refreshing? You want a refresh start? you got to rethink. The word is metanoia here. Most translations would say um, repent. That would be the word. But literally the word means to change your mind or to change or to rethink everything. And then turn to God and your sins will be forgiven. And then the times of refreshing can come. So we play a role. We play a role. We, can't, we don't just get to show up and the preacher says, God's all about second chances. He's going to zap me with the best year ever. No, we got to rethink some things. we got to take some ownership over some of the things that went awry in 2022 if we want 2023 to be different. So this morning, I'm going to get really practical, okay? And I'm going to give you five steps. And I'm telling you, this is not just information that I... Man, I hope. I spend lots of hours, okay, in preparation for these lessons. And sometimes I wonder, you know, this is the fear of all preachers or pastors, whatever you want to call us. This is the fear that we all have, that we'll take all these hours and hours and hours of preparation of trying to glean some wisdom from God's Word and then put it in a clear and meaningful way that that you can take it and you can absorb it. You can do something with it. But it's almost like... If I could illustrate, like I had a set of marbles up here, right? Little glass marbles. And these are the marbles of wisdom, or what the scripture would call pearls. The scripture would talk about casting your pearls to swine. I'm not calling y'all pigs this morning, okay? But listen, the fear is that I'll throw that wisdom out there that God gave me to share with you, and it'll bounce right off your forehead. Just, dook. ow, what was that? And that's really the only effect that it'll have. It'll just kind of shock you or disturb you just for a moment. But it won't sink in. It won't stay. So guys, I'm telling you this morning, I plead with you this morning. If you will take these five steps and actually step into them, like use them and let them be your steps, I'm telling you, you can find times of refreshing. You can have a refresh start. Let's dive in. The first one. Fill in this blank. Stop making <coughs> excuse me, excuses. Stop making excuses. We could almost just drop the mic right there and be done for the morning for some of you. You would already be well on your way to a refresh start if you could just stop making excuses. You ever been around someone who are like professional Excuse makers? (laughs) I know a bunch of those. I can be that sometimes myself. But man, you know that person. You probably have, don't say anybody's name, okay? Just get them in your head, okay? But I want you to picture that. Here's something that I find true very often. If they're really good at making excuses, they're very often not very good at anything else. Is that true of the one you had in your mind? Like they're very, and it's everybody else's fault why nothing is going right. Everything's just woe is me. They pull out that card out their back pocket that says victim in giant bold print. And it's everybody else's fault. And I've got every excuse in the world why I can't ever get over the hump. I can't ever change. You can write this down. It's not one of your blanks, but find room somewhere because we need to write this down. In the margins, whatever it takes. But write this down. The biggest barrier to my success 
is my own excuses. The biggest barrier to my success is my own excuses. Now, if you really want this sermon to hit hard for you, think of some of your excuses. Don't think about that person that's really good about it, okay? I want you to think about yourself for a minute. What are your number one excuses? What are your go-tos? You know, there are a lot of folks in the Bible who gave God a bunch of excuses. All throughout Scripture, you find it. I mean, some of our heroes of the faith, right? Jonah had some excuses why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. If you don't know that story, it's okay. Look it up sometime. I'll give you some extra stuff to study, okay? Moses, when God appeared to him in the burning bush, he's like, nah, I don't know if you got the right guy. You want me to talk to Pharaoh? Uh, Maybe Aaron's a better choice. Excuses. I'm not good at speaking, Moses would say. You know, if you go over to Acts chapter 7 and you read about what is said about Moses, it says he was powerful in speech. But what was Moses' story about himself? I'm not good at it. That's insecurity showing up in Moses. It showed up in Jonah. It showed up in the prophet Jeremiah who didn't want to deliver these terrible messages that God needed him to deliver. He made excuses. God got him through that. You know who my favorite was, though, that made the excuse? We're going to read about him right now. His name was Gideon. And God calls Gideon to liberate God's people from their enemy that was oppressing them. But here, look at Gideon's response. When God calls him to be the guy that would liberate them and set them free, look at Gideon's response. He makes excuses. In Judges 6, 15 through 16, listen to this. But but Lord, Gideon replied, Hold on a second. Let me just, I want you to circle, but Lord, because that shouldn't be a phrase, okay? If he's Lord, then just do it. Our problem is we call Jesus Lord, but he ain't really. It's just a title. Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. And it doesn't go much beyond that. Jesus says to do something a certain way, and we go, "Mm, I'd rather not. Gideon says, but Lord, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I'll be with you, Gideon, and you'll destroy the Midianites, plural, as if you were fighting against one man. He goes, this is going to be a piece of cake for you. Why? Not because you're so awesome, Gideon. Even though the Lord calls him a mighty warrior. God says, you're a mighty warrior. Go set them free. And he goes, but Lord, my clan's the worst. Pick a better clan. And then I'm the weakest out of all of them. And God says, it's going to be a piece of cake because I'm with you. Boy, if we could just believe that. Some of you guys make excuses I want to give you excuse number one that we see here with Gideon. And I think you could probably recognize it in yourself if you're honest. Have you ever felt this way? I don't have what it takes. That's what Gideon thought. There's someone better for this job than me. I'm not qualified. I'm not good enough. This is the problem with with churches across our nation um, that are not growing Now, if they are growing, they're only growing, and I know this, this is not just me uh, saying just anything, but we've, we've done lots and lots of research on this, and we've found, and the reason we're here to plant a church is because of this reality. There are a lot of churches that are growing, but it's what we call transfer growth. In other words, we'll bring in a better preacher than the guy down the road, and we'll have better singing or a better band or a better whatever, and we'll have a better experience overall, and we'll draw your church members over to this church, and we call that growth. And then preachers are getting rich because their congregations are growing, and so the contribution grows. And so now they've got this this false sense of growth and, and security in these numbers of people, but it's really not anybody's lives being changed. It's just people coming and getting entertained week in and week out until it's not entertaining anymore, until a better show comes down the road, and then we move again. 
Guys, it's such an illusion. And it's not what God sent his church to be about. To just be a popularity contest of who can do something in a more entertaining way. It's about finding people that are lost. And helping them find transformation. Helping them come to a refresh start in their lives. But I don't have what it takes. Anybody in here ever said that? Like somebody's more qualified. Like I'll leave, I'll leave telling Jesus, uh, telling people about Jesus, I'll leave that to the preacher who went to Bible school, who's got a degree in Bible. I'll leave that to the professionals. Man, do y'all even know who Jesus picked to go change the world? It was the leftovers. It was the ones that none of the other rabbis wanted. That's why they were fishing. That's why they were tax collectors. Because there was not a rabbi that said, hey, come and follow me and I'll show you how to do what I do and you'll become the next rabbi. They said, no, 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 you go do your father's trade. So it was the leftovers. God says, but Jesus says, I want y'all. I want, I want y'all leftovers. You know why I want you? I don't want the professionals. Because the professionals will take credit for the growth. But if you can do it, if you can change the world, I'll get all the glory. Man. We have what it takes. You know what we have? Jesus. It ain't about you. It ain't about how talented you are. Y'all might, um, here's another thing that we do. We want people that are gifted in certain areas to use their gifts. But at the same time, we've got to guard against that because people will see that gift and they'll get intimidated by it. And they'll say, I could never do what they do. We've got to be careful with that. We need to be training and equipping and releasing people to do and to show them how to embrace their gifts. Look at the second excuse that people have, and tell me if you've ever said something like this. I've tried and I failed in the past. So in other words, I'm not going to do it again because I've already failed and I was embarrassed the first time. I don't want to go through that again. Listen, if you're saying this morning that this is your excuse, I've tried and failed, welcome to the human race. Every one of us has failed. A whole bunch of times. And we're going to do it again and again and again. Here's another false perception. You go to church and it's like everybody's better than you, right? That's the perception. Or you might buy into that lie. Oh, look at that guy. He's got it all together, man. My life is in shambles. But boy, it must be nice to be him or her. But that's just lies. We all are failures, uh, Dimitri brought it up when we were taking of the Lord's Supper. He said, a thousand times I've failed. That's one of the songs we sing. A thousand times I've failed, yet you still love me. You're still faithful. So put this nonsense behind us, this excuse. It's not a valid excuse to say I've failed in the past. Everybody has. Do you know, y'all have heard me say this before. The past is not meant to be a hitching post. It's meant to be a guide post. Now, some of y'all don't know what a hitching post is. Some of you do. It's where, you know, people used to ride into town on a horse, right? And you'd have to tie them up at the hitching post. So you can go in, get your groceries, come back out and get on your horse and go home. But it ties you down, in other words. The past is not meant to, to paralyze you and tie you down and to keep you in that place. It's meant to teach you something. So, guys, when you fail, look at failure as an opportunity to learn and to be better, to do something different the next time. Don't let it stick you in the past and paralyze you. Look at Isaiah chapter 43 on your notes uh, or on the screen. Verses 18 and 19, it says, But the Lord says, Don't cling to events of the past or dwell on what happened long ago. Watch for the new thing that I'm going to do. It's happening already. You can see it now. See, some of you go, well, I don't see it. Well, there's a reason. Because you're looking backwards. Do you know what would happen if you drove your car that way? All you ever did was look in the rear view mirror instead of looking straight ahead at what's going on. You're going to have a problem. If all you're doing is looking into your past and gazing and gazing and gazing. And just meditating and meditating and getting lost in your past. You'll ne- you're going to crash. You're going to burn. It's going to be terrible. There is no hopeful future for such behavior. We've got to stop making these excuses. God has great plans for our future. But listen to Proverbs 28, verse 13. It says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. 
But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Why, does, why do people not admit their mistakes? Boy, I hate admitting mistakes. But why is that? What is wrong with me? Why, do I not, why am I not just happy to go, I was wrong? Like my wife. Hey, Danielle, I can't wait to tell you this, girl. I was wrong. Why is that so hard? Because we're prideful. And pride does not lead to a refreshed life. Humility does. Humility that's willing to say, I made a mistake. I need some help to overcome it. That gets you on the road. But this excuse making, I don't have what it takes. I'm not qualified. Or I tried and I failed in the past, so I don't want to try again. I might fall on my face again. Instead of learning from the past and moving on and doing better. Let me give you excuse number three. Write this one down. Y'all ever said this? Some things I just can't control. (laughs) What an excuse. Of course you can't. There's a million things you can't control. You can't control the weather. You can't control the economy. Boy, it's not that distant in our past when we could not control this thing called a pandemic or when we could go back to work or when we could mask or unmask or all those things. None, None of that was within our control. There's a million things that you could list that are not in your control, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that that's a valid excuse because there's a ton of things you can control. You can't control the weather, you can't control the economy, you can't control pandemics. You know what you can control? You can control your attitude. You can control where you spend your time. You can control who you spend it with, positive or negative influences, right? Scripture says bad company corrupts good character. Boy, if you hadn't figured that one out, uh, I mean, are you asleep? I mean, because it's obvious, man. It's easy to get drugged down. You're trying to pull, you're trying to, you're up here on this, you're up here like this, man, and you're trying to pick somebody up. What's easier, for you to pick them up where you're at or for them to pull you off this chair? Yeah, way easier. And so we've got to understand that there are things that we can control. We've got to be wise in the way we make decisions. When things get hard, that doesn't mean it's time to give up. During trying times, write this down. During trying times, it doesn't mean you quit trying. It means you try harder. Do you know most churches, it might sound like I'm picking on churches. I'm not calling any names, guys. I just know that this is reality. You can ask around, man. Most churches during the pandemic were shrinking. Some of them died. I'm not talking about like they, they all just died. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the doors of the church shut and they couldn't continue anymore because the pandemic basically put the nail in the coffin that was probably coming for a long time. But guys, this is not to brag on anybody but God, but Crossway, little old Crossway that just got its start with 24 people. We grew during the pandemic. We saw people baptized during the pandemic. How do you do that? (laughs) Over the phone? (laughs) Like dunk yourself or something? I don't know. No, we didn't do that. But we would study over the phone, over Zoom with people, and we would have, and then we would meet them. And we'd wear our masks, and we'd be careful, and then we'd dunk them, and then we'd run back home. <laughs> you know, but, but we grew. Why? Because we're so great? No. Here's why we grew. I'm going to give you the secret sauce. Because we were intentional. When things got hard, when things were trying, we tried harder. And we figured it out. We made a way. Of course, things you can't control. You can't control the calendar, but you know what you can control? Your character. You can't control the calendar, but you can control your character. What are your goals for this new year? Do you have any? I know one of them that could be, I want to be more like Jesus in this area of my life. This character flaw that I have, I want to get past it. Some of y'all have had the same character flaw for years, (laughs) if not for your entire life. Can this be the refresh start where you can say, you know, no more? I'm tired of telling the same old story. 
And here's the thing. We, we, sell, we talk about Jesus and we say, look, he died and then he rose from the dead. Cool. Good for him. What's that have to do with us? Well, listen, he says you have access to resurrection power. Something that can turn death into life. You have access to that. But it's just a matter of are you going to tap into it or are you going to make excuses and just say, oh, I just can't control everything. Cool. Then control what you can and let's move forward. Right? Excuse number four. I skipped a verse. Let's, let's not skip the scripture here. In Proverbs 24.10, right before we get to this next excuse, it says, Don't give up and be helpless in times of trouble. See, so many people are like, I'm just, I don't know what to do. It's so hard. You know, pandemic. <laughs> it's like, come on. And the scripture said, we believe the scripture. Don't give up and be helpless in times of trouble. Work harder, right? That's what God says. All right, let's get to excuse number four. I don't know what the future holds. Well, duh. <laughs> you know, nobody does. I know there's some people on the TV that claim they do. And like they got a little crystal ball and stuff and take all your money to read your palm. But listen, they don't know nothing beyond what Jesus knows. You got these preachers out there telling you when Jesus is going to come back. You know what the scripture says? Jesus don't even know when he's coming back. Of course you don't know the future. whoop dee doo da day You're not like making some earth-shattering... You know, announcement there. None of us know the future. But you know what? We don't know what the future holds. But I know who holds the future. And so I can move. I can do something. Right? I can make progress. I can have a refresh start. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 4 it says, If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. Some of y'all, I mean, anybody else struggle with that? Like you're, it's like paralysis by analysis. Like you're waiting on everything just to line up perfectly. Like you're just waiting on your coworker. You're, you'll talk to him about Jesus eventually, but you're just waiting on just the right time. Listen, I did that once, and that person didn't make it to my next conversation. They didn't live. And nobody's promised tomorrow. What are we doing? We're making excuses and missing opportunity. Of course, you don't know the future. But that's no excuse to not have a great refresh start. Make sure I'm not leaving anything out here. Turn to somebody and say, no more excuses. Now, come on now, listen. Y'all have heard some word of God already, okay? I need y'all to say that with some conviction. I want you to look somebody dead in the eye right now. Turn to them and say, no more excuses. That's right. There's no more excuses. We ain't playing games. God's not playing games. Boy, if y'all are visiting this morning, you're like, this dude is crazy. I'm already having to talk to people. I'm nervous. I don't like it. That's an excuse. Stop it. <laughs> no, but seriously, we don't want you to be uncomfortable, but we kind of do. We need to get uncomfortable before we can grow. There is no growth without some discomfort. Say amen when you can. Amen. amen. All right, let's start spelling this word, start. Did y'all notice I did that little cute acrostic? All right, we're going to have a... A refresh what? Start. So the first letter is S. Stop making excuses. What's our first T? Take inventory of what God has given me. Take inventory of what God has given me. Now, I want to I tell you, this is, this is all about discovering what you're working with. Everybody in here is working with something. Right? Everybody in here has got a little bit of something different that you bring to the table that's unique to you. And all God is asking you is to use what I gave you. Don't use what everybody else has got. You go, look at that guy up there with the microphone talking to us this morning. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. If I had the microphone, I'd probably be shaking like a leaf. And that's not for me. I don't know. Cool. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's something you need to grow into. I had to grow into this. I was a leaf once upon a time shaking about as bad as it could be shook. Nervous. Had to go throw up afterwards. <laughs> like... Knees knocking, not enough spit in my mouth to say words, I was choking. Maybe you need to grow into a gift, or maybe it's not your gift at all. Don't look at everybody else and go, well, I can't do what they do. Cool, you're not them. Let them do them. But you find out what God gave you. Take an inventory. This is important. Ask this question, what are my assets? What am I working with? What has God given me? Your gifts, your abilities, your personality, your unique experiences that only you have shared. 
your character assets, your physical assets, your financial assets, your spiritual assets, every kind of asset you got, just sit down and think about what has God given me uniquely that I can turn around and use to have a great fresh start in 2023, a refresh start. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, look at what the Apostle Paul writes to these disciples in a city called Colossae. He says, you have everything. <laughs> well, that's a lot of assets. He says, you have everything when you have Christ, and you're filled with God through your union with Christ. He's the highest ruler with authority over every other power. Now, here's the thing. I, didn't, I, I went to church long before I had Christ, okay? And may, I don't know where everybody is this morning. Maybe you don't have Christ just yet in that way. Maybe you're still in your pursuit. You're trying to feel things out. Is Jesus real or is he just some pie-in-the-sky fairy tale that people just believe in so they can sleep better at night? Or is it legit? Like, is there real evidence for it? Or do I just blindly believe stuff that doesn't make any sense? I don't know where you're at in your journey. I encourage you to bring those doubts to the table. Give them full vent. Because here's the thing. I know this. Because I was one of the biggest cynics and one of the, the, the most um, cynical, not atheist, but I doubted whether Jesus was really the answer, right? Like, of course, I felt like something had to have created all of this. It's very difficult to believe that we got this world from an accident or even a series of accidents or coincidences. That just doesn't make sense uh, in a lot of ways, scientifically or any other kind of way. But I wondered if Jesus was really the way or if it could have been some of these others, you know, Buddha, maybe, maybe he had the answers or Muhammad or some of these other so-called prophets. But guys, I encourage you to know that God is not afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your doubts and he wants you to bring them to the table. Because truth is never afraid of inquiry, ever. And the truth is not going to change. Because you believe something. You need to ask, what are my assets? And let God reveal them to you. You need to also ask, what have I learned? This is another important question. When you're taking inventory of what God has given you, He's given you some lessons, hasn't He? Haven't you been taught some things, whether it was through hardship or through victory or whatever? But you've learned some things. Uh, in fact, Galatians chapter 3, verse 4 says, You have experienced many things. Were all those experiences wasted? Now, that's a fair question. Y'all have heard me say this before. Don't waste your hurts. All of us have went through hurtful things. People have hurt us. Some deep hurts and wounds. We've got folks in this room that came on this church plant that can tell you their story. And if you come tonight, you'll hear some of this uh, during the banquet that we have. Um, but you'll hear stories of verbal, physical, sexual abuse. Pe there are real hurts that people have gone through, real addictions that people have come out of and overcome. There's real deep-seated hurts, uh, struggles with forgiving those that hurt us, and, but victory stories over the, the fact that they have been able to do that. But there's all these, le here's the thing, do you go through the hurt and you just bottle it up and let it continue to hurt you? Or do you seek to find out if there's healing available and do you seek to learn from those hurts? Don't waste hurts. There's going to be someone, if you get serious enough about Jesus, you decide to surrender your life to him and let him be, really be Lord, not just in word, but actually let him be Lord. There's going to be people that come into your life who had the same struggle, but they're in the middle of it, whereas you've already escaped. You've already found healing. And God says, don't waste that hurt. Share it with them. Help them. We can't waste hurts. We need to ask, what have we learned? We learn from experience. We also learn through the Word of God, I hope. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, look at what Paul says to his young apprentice named Timothy. He says, you should continue following the teachings that you learned, Timothy. You know they're true. Notice what he says. Because you trust those who taught you. See, some of you guys are learning from the wrong sources. Paul is able to say, Timothy, you know the source. It's me, the Apostle Paul, who's been confirmed through miracles and through Jesus himself confirming me. He says, you know the source. Consider the source. Some of y'all need to turn to somebody and say, consider the source. 
Because some of you, say it, say it with some, say it with your chest. Consider the source. You need to consider where you're learning from. Man, listen, some of y'all are the worst researchers on the planet. You think you're instantly brilliant just because you type in a question on Google or ask.com and, and you find an answer. That is not research. That is not real. I mean, you, you're going to end up with all kinds of crazy stuff. Guys, can I tell you, you got to be careful what preachers you listen to. You do. Guys, we're all human. I would tell you, even when you listen to me, I'm going to do my very best. But that's just my word to you. You don't know. Some of y'all don't know me from Adam. Some of you know me very well, and you consider the source, and you go, no, he's trustworthy. I know him. Some of you don't know me from Adam. And listen, I'm the first one to encourage you. You go back. After today is over with, you go back, take your notes, look at God's word that we covered, and you go ask yourself if what you heard this morning matches what God says or not. And that's your responsibility. None of us get to judgment day and get to go, well, Mackie told me, Lord. That's excuses. God's going to say, well, what did I tell you? Why would you trust old Mackie up there? What's so special about him? I'm special. My word's the thing. So maybe you should have checked up on what Mackie was saying. Let my word be the standard. Learn something from the word. The third question you need to ask, write this down. Who can help me? You want to have a refresh start? You're going to need some help. You try to lone range your Christian this thing, you ain't going to make it. That's why community is so important. It's why God gave us the church. He didn't create the church to be this weird, you know, weird-looking building that's gothic and stained glass. I mean, all that stuff is, I guess, fine. But that wasn't the point. That's not what Jesus' vision for the church was. It was never buildings. It was, it was about people and community that could do life together because life is hard. That when I go to work and my, my coworkers in my ear and saying all these horrible things that are not good and not true, and I start to believe them, I can come back to my community and I can get realigned and I can get reset, I can get refreshed. Right? That's what church is supposed to be. Not some weird place that we just go and do weird things and check off our religious to-do list. It's supposed to be a family where we do life together. We at Crossway, we, we extend that invitation. That's what we are. We're a family. We have small groups. We, we're not a church that has small groups. We are a small group church. In other words, we can't exist without them. There is no way that people, anyone, anywhere can survive just coming to church once a week. And here, I don't care how good the sermon is. It ain't good enough to last you seven days. And I would argue if you ain't filling in the blanks today, it ain't going to last you much more than the hour that you're here. It'll go whoop right out there or peg you like that marble right on your forehead. And it'll be a little splash in the pan. You'll remember it. Oh, that was cute. Ha ha. I laughed at that jokey. But it ain't going to have any lasting effect. But man, if you write those things down, do you know this is science? This is not my opinion. This is science. You write it down, it'll stick. Every time, it'll stick longer. You're still going to eventually forget it. But what if you reviewed it during the week? What if you stuck it on your fridge and every morning you just took another scripture and you prayed through it? What, what, if, what if we were proactive with God's word and let it actually teach us and learn something from it? What if we wrote these things down? But it says, who can help me? Proverbs 15, 22. Look at this. Get all the advice you can and you'll succeed. Without it, you will fail. Boy, that's Debbie Downer passage right there. But it's just real. You get help, you'll succeed. You do it by yourself, it says, you're not, not you might fail. It says, you're going to fail. That's the way it works. We need accountability. We need people to look us in our eyeballs and tell us when we're off base. We need that relationship. It's the way that Jesus designed it. We, ha we handle that through small groups here at Crossway. Let's fill in the A. We've got to get through this. We need to act in faith. There's too many people in this world, the religious world. I'm going to blame the religious world. There's too many people out there defining faith in unbiblical ways. You know what most people think faith means? They think it means, I just believe that God exists. Well, cool. You know what the brother of Jesus named James would say about that? He says, good, you believe there's one God. Even the demons believe that. So, Congratulations, you're in demon company when you believe that there's a God. Wow. You know, that's not revolutionary. See, the difference is demons aren't in submission to him. They're not obeying him. They're against him, right? 
So faith, James would argue, and Paul would argue, they tend to think that Paul and James are at odds. They're not. You just have to understand the context. But faith is a verb. It is action. It means obedience. You can't define faith without having the promise of God in the definition, meaning God says, if you do this, I'll do this. There's his promise. But you also can't define faith without i got to do what he said in order to claim the promise. So there's obedience and there's a promise. A promise and the obedience to the promise. In Matthew 9, verse 29, it says, and this is Jesus talking, he says, according to your faith, let it be done to you. See, he doesn't say, I'm just going to zap you with a blessing. He says, according to your faith, let it be done to you. We need a proper definition. We need to hear the promise of God. We need to respond to it. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 9. We should make plans, counting on God to direct us. Did you know that it was biblical to set goals? Like this New Year's resolution stuff isn't a bad idea. It's actually a biblical idea. Now, don't wait until the, the new year to always do it. You can just start on the new week, you know, or, or the new day. Right? His mercies are new every morning. So we could start every new day with a refresh start. But we need to make plans. If you fail to plan, write it down. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Making plans with God directing you, isn't that really what faith is? And by the way, it's the only way to please God. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You want to please Him this new year in 2023? You want to be pleasing to Him? You want to bring a smile to God's face? Then make plans that He helped you make that are based on His promises, that are based on His Word, and then take action. Like, step into that. That's faith. And that makes God go, that's my boy. That's my girl. At a boy, at a girl. What faith goals are you going to set today? What faith goals are you going to set this week? What faith goals are you going to set this month? What faith goals are you going to set this year? You need to set some. You need to write them down. And next, let's get to the R. We're almost done. If we're going to have a refresh start, we need to renew our minds. This is the key to a refresh start. In Ephesians 4.23 it says, And he continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental and spiritual attitude. He says, be continually renewed. Like, ain't nobody in here got there. You ain't arrived. This is something that's going to happen to the day you kick the bucket. You're going to need to renew your mind. One of my heroes in the faith, he's dead now. Um, I'll see him again, and I rejoice in that. And he was ready to go home, boy. He was eager. His wife had been deceased for over a decade, and he was ready to go be with his sweet baboo. That's what he called her, sweet baboo. She was Miss Oklahoma back in the day. He wanted to go be with sweet baboo. He was ready to go. But one thing he said before he died, he was in his 90s. And someone asked him, they said, Brother Clyde, when does it get easier when a pretty girl walks by, that I won't have a struggle with lust. When does that get easier? At what, what age? You're 90. You could tell us. You know what he said? I don't know. He ain't got to that age yet. Clyde would have been the first one to tell you, I have to renew my mind daily. And he was the godliest man I probably have ever known. Put me to shame. But we have to renew our minds. That's where it starts. Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Paul would say to the Roman church, he would say, Don't conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect. Well, here's the question. Cool, Paul. You say, I got to renew my mind. I got to change my mind. I can't conform to the way the world thinks. I got to change. By the way, everybody in here has been infected by the world and your culture. 
You've bought into certain lies, whether you realize it or not. And that's why we have to continually renew our minds. So you say, well, how do you do that? How do I make sure that my mind is renewed and not buying into some of these lies that our world tells you? I'm going to give you two ways. You ready? The first way is listen more to God's word than all the other voices. I told you I'm getting practical. This is not rocket science. Whoever you listen to the most is the thing you're going to believe the most. Whoever you listen to the most, you're going to believe the most. We need to make sure that God's word and getting in it and studying it and familiarizing ourselves with it is a priority and that we allow that to saturate our minds more than we let the culture saturate our minds. In Psalm 1, 1 through 3, it says, Happy are those who love the Lord's teachings. They think about those teachings day and night. Now, some of y'all go to bed thinking about who's going to be the next president day and night. Some of y'all worry more about the White House than you do about your own house. Some of you worry more about who's going to be the president than you do about who's sitting on the throne of heaven, which is Jesus. Listen, I read the whole, I've read the whole story. I read the end. <laughs> this world ends, and all the empires end, except one, the one that Jesus is seated on the throne of the kingdom of God. I want to dwell on the kingdom of God. Day and night. I want to dwell on his words. I want that to saturate my mind and renew my mind. Here's the second thing you can do to renew your mind. Think about what you think about. <laughs> You're like, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> what do you mean? I want you to think about what you think about. Here's what I mean. Let me explain. Listen, everybody in here. Some more so than others, okay? My mind, even while I'm preaching, I'm thinking crazy stuff sometimes. I'm just like, I have to filter it and make sure it doesn't come out of my mouth because it's getting crazy sometimes, all right? Sometimes it slips out, and y'all laugh and make fun of me. It's cool. But I try to think about what I think about because here's the thing. You can't control all the time what your brain thinks. What you can control is what you do with that thought, right? See, Clyde would tell you the pretty girl walks by and there's a thought that enters the mind. But see, Jesus wouldn't call that thought sin. Lust is another level of that and that's where, let's say I'm walking down the, uh, in, in the grocery store and I'm headed to go get some donuts. And this pretty girl walks by and she's going to get some toothpaste. I don't know why I came up with those donuts, toothpaste. Anyway, they're on different aisles, right? So I'm going this way, and then suddenly she goes by that way to go get some toothpaste, and next thing I know, I'm looking at toothbrushes. Why? See, that's different. That's different than the thought entering my mind. Now I've entertained the thought. Now I'm doing something with the thought. Now I'm doing the thing that Jesus forbade. So I need to think about what I'm thinking about. It's not on your notes, but Paul would say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You can go look it up later at the first part of that chapter. He would say, we need to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. We need to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. In other words, think of, we need to think about what we think about. And then we need to take it captive and we need to give it some serious consideration, make sure it's surrendered to Jesus that's how you renew your mind. You listen more to God than all the other voices, and there's a bunch of them. And that takes discipline. You've got to get in the Word. You've got to be surrounded by people that will help you get in the Word. And, and then you've got to think about what you think about. If you're like me, you've got a lot of crazy thoughts. You really need to filter those. Some of you say, well, I just speak my mind. That's not a good idea. That's a really dumb idea. I'm just going to put it out there. It's a really dumb idea. That's immature. It's not mature. Well, I'll just tell it like it, like it is, however I feel. I'll just tell you. That's what children do, all right? We need to have a filter. We need to have a filter. We need to think about what we think about, how it's going to benefit or hurt or damage or cause healing. We need to think about our words carefully. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, tell me if I'm wrong, but God says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. I don't know if you all know that's a newsflash for anybody, but I'm telling you. Whatever you think about is what you're going to do. You think about it long enough and hard enough, you're going to execute what you think about. So if you want to change behavior, you have to change what you think about. And you have to think about what you think about. 
and make sure it's surrendered to Jesus. Then you're good. The last letter. If we're going to have a refresh start instead of a refresh star, we need to fill in the last T. Trust that God knows what he's doing. (laughs) Well, that's the right answer. But do you believe it? That's the question. See, when things go bad, who gets the credit? The devil. If things ain't going the way you want it, the devil's coming after me. But y'all know God allows that to happen, right? You know he's involved in those negative things too. He either lets them happen. And the scripture even says there are times when he causes them. C.S. Lewis would say, That God whispers in the good times. The bad times are his megaphone to rouse a sleeping earth. Sometimes the only thing that will get through to us is to let us go through something that we would chalk up to the devil. (laughs) But it's actually God trying to get our attention. And so we need to trust that God knows what he's doing. If you want a refresh start, boy, we've got to understand that God operates a certain... Now, There's a passage in Jeremiah, and I've taught it a bunch of times. And every time I I come across it, I think about this little guy that I created. Okay, little Play-Doh guy. He's made out of Play-Doh. I created him, though. I did this with my own hands. By the way, you know what the Bible says, how we were created? Out of the dust of the earth. And he breathed into that dust man the breath of life. But he created it. And then woman, he puts the man to sleep, takes a rib out, and somehow fashions her out of his rib. So God made us both, man and woman, male and female. He created us. And I've always read this passage in Jeremiah about the, the potter and the clay that he's working with. And I've always thought about it this way. That if God, imagine this, you created this little guy. And you breathe life into him. So now he's talking to you. you got a relationship with a little dude. And you give him some instructions. In fact, you give him some demands. You say, you must do this, little guy. This is my command. And then little guy goes, no thanks. And now, can you hear the smart aleck teenager talking? (laughs) And talking like they big, like they got it figured out. What's the problem with that? This This is the message I've always taught with this passage. The problem with that is we have lost perspective. This little dude that's in my hand right now, you better shut up. I'm bigger than you, bro. And God is bigger than you. So I've often illustrated and said, bro, you talk about it one more time. And he goes, what you going to do? This is what I'm going to do. You know, like I'm the, he's stuck on my shoe now. now. But Look at the little flat guy now. See, I can do what I want. I'd be like, okay, you ain't talking no more. He's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. you know, it's like. I've squished this dude. I'm going to do what I want. I'm the creator. Right? That's the point I've always made. But I want you to see something in Jeremiah that I've never seen before or paid attention to at all. That's a message of hope. In Jeremiah 18. Sorry. Verses 2 through 4. It says, Go down to the potter's shop in the city and wait for my word. So I went down to the potter's shop and I found him making something on his wheel. And as I watched the clay vessel in his hands, it became flawed and unusable. So the potter started again with the same clay. He crushed and he squeezed and he shaped it into another vessel that was to his liking. I want you to circle the same clay. Thank God he reshapes clay. And he doesn't just discard it. Because he's had enough. But he reshapes it. He repurposes it. He refreshes it. 
and gives it a new purpose and a new identity. In Psalm 51 verse 10, it says, God, make a fresh start in me. Listen to how I love um, the message here. Paraphrase, it says, shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Wow, that's so cool. You know that's what happened in the first week, right? God created everything in six days and he rested on the seventh. You know what he did? Scripture says, the Hebrew word is, it's a really fun one, tohu wabohu. <laughs> it's really cool. Tohu wabohu. You know what that means? It means chaos. God takes the chaos and the disorder and what he does, you watch it every day. He adds a little bit more order. And he frames it and he gives it new life and new purpose. And, but it's structured. It's ordered. It's no longer chaos. And now we get here and we read that that's what this refresh start is really all about. That God make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week. Days one through six. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Order my life. Give me what you did in the beginning. Do it again. What you did then, you're the same God. I believe it. You're the same God. Do it again in my life. Give me a fresh start. Turn my chaos into order. Turn my tohu wabohu into something that can glorify you and you'll be pleased with. Last passage I'll leave you with today is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. When anyone becomes united with Christ, Paul says, he becomes a new person inside. He's not the same anymore. The old life is gone, and a fresh new life has begun. Now that's something that can happen. That's something that can happen. But what role do we play? We have to step into it. I gave you five steps. Who's going to join me in taking these steps? Who's going to join me? Nobody? Who's going to help hold me accountable to take these steps in my own life? Anybody going to help me? All right. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that it won't just be like a little marble of wisdom that bounces off people's heads. I pray it will go in our ears, that it will affect our minds, that it will penetrate our hearts. It will make a difference. Father, we'll go out from here. We won't just think about it today. We'll, hopefully we'll take those notes and we'll reflect on it through the week. We'll give your word a real shot at being the dominant voice in our life. That all these other voices that are vying for our attention, that's how Satan does. He's not super powerful. He's just got influence. He's got the influence to insert voices. He's got the influence to distract. But God, you've already beat him. At the cross, Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. He, the, the war is won. We're just in this, these battles. And God, really all we got to do is to let your voice dominate all the other voices. And then start putting those things into practice. And then when those other voices do tamper with our minds, that we'll let our minds be renewed and we'll think about what we're thinking about and take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ and your word. God, just help us to take these five steps and step into 2023 unlike we've stepped into any other year. That we'll have a refresh start. Not a fresh start where we go hide and we just start over where people don't know us. But we'll have a refresh start. Father, a, a a start that comes from repentance, a change of mind, and a change of action. And just, Father, a willingness to take these five steps that you point us to in your word. Thank you, God, for this morning. I pray as we sing this next song that everyone will take that cardstock piece of paper out of their bulletin. They'll take that opportunity during the song to fill it out. And then we'll drop those in the baskets here in just a little bit. But help our members and guests alike um, take the time to really do that and take that very seriously. This is our first opportunity to actually do something with your word this morning. Give us the courage to do so in Jesus' name.